Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. And um, we're about ready to, uh, the musicians are starting to give up their seats. Um, and so for those of you who have seats, we're very happy you're here. And we're very sorry there's a number of people outside because this program was so popular that we couldn't fit everyone in. Um, I'm Cindy Burlingham, and I'm the director of the Grunewald Center for the Graphic Arts here at the Hammer, and the deputy director of curatorial affairs. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's performance, A Fusion of Senses, Poetry, Music, Dance, and Visual Arts in Paris, 1880 to 1914. Our special program tonight examines attempts by artists, poets, and musicians to break down barriers between artistic disciplines in 19th century France. This event is being organized by Sonnets and Sonatas, which is a UCLA lecture and concert series spearheaded by Guillaume Soutre, a professor of violin and head of the chamber music at UCLA, and Laure Murat, professor in the UCLA Department of French and Francophone Studies. Under Guillaume's direction, we'll be treated to performances by some of the most gifted musicians studying at UCLA. Weaving together the music, musical selections with images from the exhibition and archival film, Laura will place the works in their social and historical context. We encourage you to read about the tremendous accomplishments of these two people in the program. What's not included there is how exceptionally generous Laura and Guillaume have been with their time and attention in conceiving and organizing all aspects of this program. And they are two of my most favorite UCLA faculty members. Yes. We're so fortunate to be able to share in their knowledge of this period. So please join me in welcoming Laura and Guillaume and the UCLA students here. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. A few months ago, the Hammer Museum invited me to give a lecture related to an exhibition entitled Tea and Morphine, Women in Paris from 1880 to 1914. Tea, Morphine, Women, Paris, who would say no to such a beautiful invitation? <laughs> I accepted with pleasure and immediately met with the curators to see the exhibit together. In front of the images, referring to music, poetry, dance, and of course, visual arts, a topic emerged <clears throat> very naturally, the idea of a fusion of the arts, which was in that fin de siècle in Paris, a very vivid concern of modernity inherited from Wagner's concept of total work of art. It became very clear at that point that sonnets and sonatas the series of performances on music and literature that Guillaume Sutre and I just launched at UCLA was the ideal framework and medium to offer you tonight a lecture screening concert on the subject of the fusion of senses. Fusion of senses, total work of art, synesthesia, although different and needing to be qualified, all these terms refer to the same antique dream of a plurality of aesthetic expressions and therefore a variety of sensations combined together, summoned in unity. The origin of this attainable utopia lies in Greek tragedy in which dance, singing, and poetry were harmonized within one single religious spectacle. But this ideal fractured little by little, arts emancipated and dissociated from one another. The growing autonomy of disciplines went hand in hand with the temptation toward isolation, separation, classification, hierarchy. In 1830, Hegel proclaimed the end of art. The philosopher, of course, didn't mean that art would never exist again, <clears throat> but that art won't provide the meaning of civilization anymore. It is partly to resist this prophecy that German romanticism, haunted by the idea of dismemberment, invented the notion of the total work of art in which arts and senses 
would be reunited and put together again, a notion taken up by Richard Wagner in 1849. The combination of music, dance, singing, but also drama, narration, decor, costumes, Opera is a very logical form that embodies the total work of art, especially because it solicits the eye or a sight that refers to space and the ear or hearing that refers to time. Underlying the total work of art is always the idea of a reconciliation of terms or even a kind of positive confusion, if I may say so. And it is no accident if Wagner decided to revolutionize production by systematically plunging the audience and the orchestra pit into the dark. This apparent separation between the concert hall and the stage actually helps the spectator to concentrate and project himself into the drama. A total art is the one which by mingling genres and overstepping limits operates the fusion of senses and reason, time and space, body and mind, and ultimately art and life. This very broad definition applies to other means of expression, especially in 19th century France. For Victor Hugo, for instance, architecture was for a long time, I quote, the total art, the sovereign art, the tyrant art, end of quote. And the cathedral was its masterpiece, anonymous, collective, hybrid, built by the people for God. The cathedral, with its carved facades, its colorful stained glass windows, its bells and organs, is the ideal book of stone Hugo eloquently described in a very famous chapter of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, entitled, This Will Kill That. At the end of the Middle Ages, Hugo explains, everything changes. The invention of the printing press dethrones architecture. As Hugo puts it, I quote, Gutenberg's letters of lead are about to supersede Orpheus's letters of stone. The book is about to kill the edifice. Volatile, irresistible, indestructible, the printed form is about to exert its formidable influence. We broach here, I think, the very specificity of the French total work of art, French culture having always assigned a special importance, if not supremacy, to literature. Only the word with capital W can realize totality with capital T. While a total work of art can be associated in Germany with philosophy and music, for instance, or in the US with dance and cinema, I'll come back to this. It is very clear that anyone who wants to study the topic in France has to start with poetry. The poet is the prince of the city. The poem, the ultimate explanation of the world. Charles Baudelaire, who embodies modernity in literature, engages with poetry as the only art able to suggest and therefore to create any sensation in the realm of the ideal. One of his poems, From the Flowers of Evil, entitled Correspondences, famously addresses the conjunction between senses and ideas that only words can convey. Set into music by the French composer Jean Cran, correspondences will be performed tonight by Rosaline Wan Wong at the piano and sung by Daniel Palomares.
Correspondences explores a rather complex idea which is at least twofold. <clears throat> First, senses, sight in green, hearing in red, touch in yellow, and smell in blue, are tied by analogy, expressed in the word com in English as or like in capital letters, that is repeated seven times in only 14 verses. But there is a second level of understanding in white. Not only are the senses echoing each other horizontally, perfumes, colors, tones answer each other, that's the verse placed in the middle of the poem, but the material world, the natural and mineral world embodied by nature, temple, pillars, or forest, is vertically corresponding to the spiritual one embodied by words, symbols, or infinite things, which leads us naturally to the concluding ecstasies of spirit and senses. In a letter dated 1856, Baudelaire reminds us, nevertheless, that this cross-pollination is not given, but relies on an interpreter, the poet, and on what he called elsewhere, the queen of the faculties, that is, imagination. I quote, I've been saying for a very long time that the poet is supremely intelligent, that he's intelligence par excellence, and that imagination is the most scientific of faculties, for it alone can understand the universal analogy or what a mystic religion calls correspondence. In 1861, Baudelaire comes back to what is at the core of his system of thought, namely synesthesia, in an article devoted to Wagner. I quote, what would be really surprising is that sound could not suggest color, that colors could not give the idea of a melody, and that sound and color were unsuited to translate ideas, things having always expressed themselves by recipro reciprocal analogy since the day when God preferred the world as a complex 
an indivisible totality. The total work of art in France relies essentially on this Baudelarian conception of lyric synesthesia. It opened the way for Stéphane Mallarmé and his celebration of the book as a total explanation of the world, but also for Arthur Rimbaud and his very famous vowels sonnet, where the poet associates each vowel to a specific color. We see here at the, the manuscript of the sonnet, a caricature of Rimbaud as a child painting the vowels in all colors, and the two first verses of this very famous poem, A noir, e blanc, et rouge, et vert, au bleu, voyelle, je dirais, quelques jours, vos naissances l'attendent. Beyond associate, associating letters with colors, colors with sounds, or even the matter with the idea, Poets let us understand that form does not only correspond to the content, but that form is the content, exactly as if we were to say, I am a body instead of I have a body. A form is an idea, an idea is a form, and forms as ideas are programmatic. Let us take a very simple example of the arabesque. Born in Islamic art, omnipresent in calligraphy, a recurring pattern in Art Nouveau painting, architecture and decorative art, the arabesque even invaded Parisian everyday life through the kiosk of the subway created by Hector Guimard on the lower right. But Arabesque is also a basic body position in classical ballet. And a genre illustrated in music by many, com many composers such, such as Schumann, Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, and of course Claude Debussy, who composed two famous arabesques as an homage to nature that inspired the Art Nouveau. Debussy even declared the musical arabesque, or rather, the principle of ornament is at the basis of all forms of art. Before we continue, let us listen to the first arabesque by Debussy, whose musical phrase, as you can see on the score, and as you are going to hear, molds the curves of the line it describes. Thank you. 
the same year Debussy composed the first arabesque at only 26, he also created La Damoiselle Élue, a piece influenced by Wagner and criticized by the Academy, I quote, bizarre, impossible to understand, and impossible to perform. <laughs> the Blessed Damoiselle, <coughs> first published in 1850, is originally a poem written by Dante Gabriele Rossetti, who was inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Rossetti th then used the same title for one of his best known paintings made in the late 70s, here on the left. Debussy was so moved by the poem, depicting a young lady observing her lover from heaven, that he composed La Damoiselle Élue, a musical piece that inspired, in turn, his friend, his, his friend Maurice Denis to give a very stylized vision of the drama here on the right. La Damoiselle Élue is a cantata for two soloists, female choir and orchestra, a format exceeding our somewhat, uh, our performance capacity for tonight. But Debussy, probably thinking of us, also wrote a piano version <laughs> whose prelude is now going to be performed by Rosalind. Thank you. 
La Damoiselle élue is a great example of a series of influences, a kind of chain reaction between poets, painters, and a musician, Debussy. Debussy is especially familiar with de this kind of fusion of the arts. He was himself an art lover, convinced of the connection between visual and musical harmonies, a collector, and a great admirer of poetry. He set to music numerous poems by Villon, Charles d'Orléans, Edgar Poe, Baudelaire, Verlaine, Mitterlinck, D'Annunzio, and Stéphane Mallarmé. Mallarmé's Afternoon of a Fawn <clears throat> inspired Debussy's famous prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, considered to be a turning point in the history of music. You can see here uh, Mallarmé, Debussy, Nijinsky in 1912, who, who choreographed the, the Afternoon of a Phone, and the um, decor by Leon Baxt. I have just come out of the concert deeply moved, wrote Mallarmé to Debussy after the premiere, the marvel. Your illustration of the Afternoon of a Phone presents a dissonance with my text only by going much further, really, into nostalgia and into light, with finesse, with uneasiness, with richness. I shake your, hang, your hand admiringly, Debussy. Nevertheless, according to Paul Valéry, his closest disciple, Mallarmé was unhappy with the process. He believed, wrote Valéry, that his own music was sufficient, and that even with the best intentions in the world, it was a veritable crime, as far as poetry cons was concerned, to juxtapose poetry and music, even if it were the fine finest music there is. So was Mallarmé moved or annoyed by Debussy's prelude? I would say both, given that the two statements are not contradictory. He liked the music for itself and for its dissonance with his text, given that he rejects juxtaposition. In Divagation, Mallarmé wrote, and I'll quote the sentence first in French and then in English for you to hear the music of the words. Allier mais ne confondre, Ce n'est point d'emblée et par traitement commun qu'il faut, faut joindre deux attitudes jalouses de leur silence respectif, la mimique et la danse, tout à coup hostile si l'on en force le rapprochement. To ally but not to confuse, it is not at the outset and by common treatment that one must join two attitudes, jealous of their respective silence, mime and dance, all of a sudden hostile, if one forces their rapprochement. The same could apply to music and literature, both sharing prosody and silence. Very important. The interesting thing is that Debussy, in a way, agrees when he writes, the music of this prelude is a very free illustration of Mallarmé's beautiful poem. By no means does it claim to be a synthesis of it. End of quote. Although directed at the same goal, arts are certainly not superimposable, nor equivalent, mostly true for Mallarmé, who considered the poem as the unique and self-sufficient total work of art in itself. Although exceptional in quality, bringing together Mallarmé, Manet, Debussy, and Nijinsky, the afternoon of a fawn is not an isolated case in that fin de siècle that was marked with incessant dialogues among artists. Those of you who visited T and Morfin probably noticed a beautiful lithograph by Eugène Grasset made for Enchantement, a song by Jules Massenet featured in his opera Hérodiade, a retelling of the biblical story based on Salomé uh, by Gustave Flaubert, written in 1877. The melody was set to a poem by Jules Ruel, and then illustrated in 1892 by Grasset, who chose to represent the enchantress conjuring two disembodied heads in the lunar glow. 
the picture presented at the Salon des Saints, Salon of the Hundred, became famous in symbolist imagery and influenced artists such as Aubrey Birdsley. It is a privilege to have Danielle tonight, accompanied with Rosalind, perform for us Enchantement by Jules Massenet. example in the exhibition is Bois Frissonnant, Trembling Trees, a lithograph by Georges Auriol illustrating a poem of Charles Croix set in music by Ernest Chausson under the title La Chanson Perpétuelle. Chausson, who studied composition with Massenet, died at the age of 44, a few months after having written what is considered his major vocal work. The poem describes with heart-breaking tones, the suffering of an abandoned woman. I'd like to invite now the Quartet Lamy to the stage with Daniel to perform La Chanson Perpétuelle by Ernest Chausson. Thank you. 
we definitely have the best student <laughs> in the world. I would like now to uh, move to the second part of this lecture, devoted to the role and the status of women in the context of the fin de siècle, the collaboration between artists and the total work of art. So far, we have seen women appear as models, muses, fetishes. In some, a figment of male imagination, a fantasy. Between the saint and the witch, Salome ordering a beheading and the abandoned woman about to die like Ophelia, it sounds like there is no room for figures other than basically the mother and the prostitute. The good news is that is not true. <laughs> Even Eugène Grasset, who complacently represented la vitrioleuse, the acid thrower, a reminder of the Parisian revolutionary figure of the fe female fire riser, or la morphinomane, the morphine addict, acknowledged the, exi the ex existence of the draftswoman on the left and the woman of science on the right. I couldn't resist, resist placing in the middle the vignette grasse design for the Larousse dictionary with a motto every French pupil knew by heart Je sème à tout vent, I saw to all winds, meaning I propagate knowledge everywhere. Even though choosing women to embody allegories has always been ambiguous, as if the symbolic representation was an easy way to clear a political issue, as if prestige was conveniently replacing the missing reality. Women were slowly changing their status from patient to agent. For female composers, things have always been especially difficult. Famous cases like Fanny Mandelson, Felix's sister, and Clara Schumann, Robert's wife, were constrained by their personal relationship to great male composers that made them be known at the same time. They both suffered from the prejudice against women. Mendelssohn's father writing in 1820 to his daughter, a child prodigy, music will perhaps become his, Felix's, profession, while for you it can and must be only an ornament. Meanwhile, Clara Schumann, greatly encouraged by her father, finally lost confidence in herself as a composer, writing, I once believed that I possessed creative talent, but I have given up this idea. A woman must not desire to compose. There has never yet been one able to do it. <clears throat> Should I expect to be the one? But with eight children and a husband ending up in a lunatic asylum, she hardly had the time to properly answer the question. <laughs> At the end of the 19th century, the situation was evolving. As the case of Marie Jaël, child prodigy, pianist and composer, proves. In 1866, she married Alfred Jaël, a pianist with an international reputation, with whom she formed a very successful artistic couple, as we can see on the screen, Perform performing all over Europe. Encouraged by Liszt, she studied composition with Gabriel Fauré and Camille Saint-Saëns, and was one of the first women to join the Society of Composers in Paris. A remarkable professor, Marie Jaël developed a method for piano based on psychophysiology that is still in use today. As a composer and a performer, her style was unanim unanimously praised as powerful, passionate, although some critics at the time regretted the lack of, I quote, feminism. <laughs> Marie Jaël was quite recently rediscovered. Her string quartet remained unpublished until 2010. To my knowledge, tonight is the first time that it, or rather its second movement only, will be performed in the US, thanks to the quartet Lamy.
The second great female composer I would now like to introduce is better known. Lily Boulanger was the first female composer to win the Prix de Rome, a child prodigy also, and a student of Gabrielle Fauré. She sang, played piano, organ, violin, cello, and harp. Exceptionally gifted, her work, influenced by Debussy, had a great impact on her contemporaries notably Arthur Honegger. She was promised to a brilliant career, but the Crohn disease, a kind of intestinal tuberculosis, cut short her life at the age of 24, leaving behind a sister, Nadia, to whom she had been very close. It's the old lady on the left, on the right corner. Nadia was also a musician who basically gave up uh, composition after her sister's death and devoted her life to teach harmony, counterpoint, musical analysis, and composition to artists such as Aaron, Aaron Copeland, John Elliott Gardiner, Dino Lipati, Quincy Jones, Philip Glass, and Astor Piazzolla. She was internationally known as Mademoiselle, a very charismatic figure, although very authoritarian, rigorous and Catholic. <laughs> the Nocturne by Lily Boulanger that we are going to hear was composed in 1911. There are two versions, one for violin, another one for cello. We will hear the latter with Rosalind at the piano and Hilary Smith at the cello.
utopia of the total work of art lies not only the idea of a reconciliation of the arts, there is also a militant blurring of the limits between the so-called high art and popular art, between art and life, reflection and entertainment. What a better place to experience such a conjunction than the cabaret and the café concert, certainly the most creative places in Paris at the time. Le Moulin Rouge, les Folies Bergères, le Chat Noir, l'Hippodrome, le Divan Japonais are among the theatres and nightclubs Toulouse-Lautrec and other artists visited every night. Their images demonstrate that reality, as the work of art, is a totality. Cabaret are the temples of performance, and performance was being reinvented by women. Louise Weber, nicknamed La Goulue, the gluten, because she was downing customers' drink while dancing between the tables, is the heroine of French Cancan, referred to as the Queen of Montmartre. Jeanne Avril, a former patient of Dr. Jean-Martin Charcot, who worked with female hysterics at La Salpetriere, claimed to have cured herself by dancing Every year, there was a very famous ball at La Salpetriere called Le Bal des Folles, the Ball of the Lunatics. By dancing and ultimately succeeded to La Goulue. Yvette Gilbert was not only a singer, she created a new character with cocky humor, a figure of a diseuse or sayer with long black gloves and vivid gestures, a storyteller who captivated a huge audience, including fans named George Bernard Shaw and Sigmund Freud. <laughs> Women were no longer the object of the spectacle, but became the subject of their own representation. They were now running the show. Dance was instrumental in this process because it liberates the bodies and favors encounters. Beside French Cancan, Polka, Mazurka, and Waltz were the most popular pieces played in the cabaret. And in order to give you a glimpse of the atmosphere, we chose two waltzes. The first was written by Cécile Chaminade on the left, a very successful pianist and composer of the time. It is called L'Amour Captif, Love as Captive. The second one was and remains a hit, and I'm sure you will easily recognize the tune. It is called Je te veux, I want you, and it is signed Eric Satie.
Creativity of the fin de siècle, a special place of honor has to be made for an American dancer who created a sensation at the Folie Bergère in 1892, Loy Fuller. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Loy Fuller revolutionized choreography by developing a new technique that is going to pave the way for modern dance. The note on the Metropolitan Museum website where I found these incredible pictures recently discovered describes Fuller's innovation as follow. Manipulating with bamboo sticks an immense skirt made of over a hundred yards of translucent iridescent silk, 
The dancer evoke organic forms, butterflies, flowers, and flames in perpetual metamorphosis through a play of colored light. Leufiller's innovating lighting effect, some of which she patented, transformed her dancers into enthralling synthesis of movement, color, and music in which the dancer herself all but vanished. <laughs> what is this invention, if not an ideal version of the total work of art epitomized in one person who ends up being a ghost? What is this invention simultaneously, if not the birth certificate, if I may say so, of the death of the author? Mallarmé was among the first to identify the importance of such a creation, certainly the closest, but the closest one to his own conception of art as the realm of suggestion and the triumph of the anonymous idea. In a memorable article to the National Observer in London, he praised Lloyd Fuller as an inexhaustible fountain of herself. Fontaine intarissable d'elle-même, and added, nothing astonishing that this prodigy should be born in America. <laughs> and it is Greek, classic insofar as entirely modern. Rien n'étonne que ce prodige naisse d'Amérique et c'est grec, classique en tant que moderne, tout à fait. Malarmé sounds weird in English, but don't worry, it sounds exactly the same weird in French. So, <clears throat> but it's beautiful, believe me. Loy Fuller not only became the embodiment of Art Nouveau, her sinuous figure was transformed into posters and sculptures. Uh, from left to right, you have posters by Pal, Schubrak, and Chéré. On the left side, a vase of Hans Stoltenberg Lerch, and on the upper right side, a lamp by Raoul Larche. She inspired great artists such as Coloman Moser or Toulouse-Lautrec, or writers such as the critic Roger Marx, who wrote a book about her that you can see in a case uh, in the exhibition, beautifully illustrated by Pierre Roche. Although very cautious to protect and patent her innovations, Loyfuller had many followers and imitators. Her tremendous success in Europe also paved the way for the careers of later dancers like Isadora Duncan, whom she supported and introduced to the French public. The modernity of Loy Fuller also consisted in the recording of her performances thanks to a new invention released by the Lumiere brothers in 1895, cinema. Cinema that can be considered, after all, as the outcome of decades of research about the concept of total work of art. I'm very happy and rather proud to offer you tonight a special screening of a contemporary uh, imitation of Loy Fuller's famous serpentine dance edited by my dear colleague, Guillaume Sutre, whose violon d'ingre is technology and computers. Guillaume also adjusted the pace of the movie to match the beat of the music. But what music? Looking at the archives, I discovered that Loy Fuller's favorite music to dance to was a waltz played by a violin called Loin du Bal, Far From the Ball. We rediscovered the score and try to imagine a kind of reconstitution between the screening of the film and the music, the music performed at the same time by, by Rosalind Wan Wong at the piano and Guillaume Sutre at the violin. <laughs> 